Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ARE Discussions, a monthly webinar where we host experts to discuss issues facing California's agricultural and natural resource communities. My name is Tina Saitone, and I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Davis. I want to thank you all for joining our live webinar today. Um, it's the third in a series on topics surrounding the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. This webinar is hosted and organized by Cooperative Extension Specialists in Agricultural and Resource Economics across three UC campuses. Brittany Goodrich and myself are specialists at UC Davis. Mehdi Namani is a specialist at UC Riverside, and Ellen Bruno is a specialist at UC Berkeley. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar will run for 90 minutes. Um, we'll have about an hour of introduction, background, and guided Q&A between our hosts and our guests. And that will be followed by approximately 30 minutes of question and answer from the audience. So please be submitting your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar. Brittany will be collecting those and asking those of our webinar participants at the end. Um, I want to remind you all that our webinars are recorded and are available on our website, which is arediscussions.ucdavis.edu. So as I mentioned, um, this is our third in a webinar series focused on SIGMA. Today we're going to be focusing on how the management of fisheries may be informative for the development of water markets. I'd like to briefly introduce you to our guests. First is Arthur Waddle who's a PhD student in Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Berkeley. We also have Kaylin Kretz, an assistant professor in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. And two individuals from AquaShares. First, James Workman is the founder and vice president of business development. And Matt Kennedy is gonna be joining us toward the end of the program for Q&A. He is the president and CEO. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Arthur, who is going to give us a brief introduction and some background on Sigma before we get started with the guided Q&A with our guests. Thank you very much for joining us. Arthur, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. So like Tina said, my name's Arthur Wardle. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and I'm presenting today some data and analysis of that data. It's part of a project I'm doing with uh, Dr. Bruno and an undergraduate, Paige Briggs at Berkeley, hoping to give some background on where we are in Sigma, since Sigma is going to be a long process, as well as kind of tee up some of the conversation about fisheries by talking about what the role of groundwater markets looks like it might be uh, as Sigma develops. So the basics of Sigma is that it requires groundwater basins in California to develop plans to prevent issues associated with long-term unsustainable extraction of groundwater. Uh, the getting back to sustainability is going to require pretty sharp reductions in groundwater extraction in many parts of the state. And the amount of agricultural land that needs to come out of production and other things like that is going to depend heavily on the management actions that basins decide to take to get back to sustainability. So the structure of Sigma looks like this. On the right hand side first, you see the Department of Water Resources to, uh, split the state into sub basins, which are designated high, medium, low, or very low priority, depending not only on the extent of their current groundwater issues, but also on things like projected future demand for groundwater. In the high and medium priority basins, uh, local agencies, pre-existing local agencies with land and water use responsibilities uh, needed to join together to form groundwater sustainability agencies. They could do that either independently, say a water district takes over the GSA mantle for its service territory, or multiple agencies, including cities and counties, can come together and form a collaborative GSA. Those agencies are then responsible for producing groundwater sustainability plans, which they can either, again, do independently or because these uh, plans tend to be pretty intricate and long and expensive to write, uh, many GSAs decided to do this collaboratively, working together on a single plan. And then 
ultimately those plans have to cover the entire sub basins and the sub basin is kind of the highest unit of, of management at issue under sigma um, and in some cases a sub basin is just the entire area of land overlying a single aquifer but in most cases in many of the most important cases like the san joaquin valley the underlying aquifer is so huge that it would be unrealistic to try to coordinate closely demand across the entire aquifer. So instead it was split into different sub-basins. So a sub-basin and a single aquifer aren't necessarily synonyms under Sigma. Um, here's where we are in that timeline. In 2015, the basin prioritization occurred. Uh, by 2017, local agencies in those high and medium priority basins had formed groundwater sustainability agencies whose territories jointly covered the sub-basins. Uh, in January of last year, GSAs in critically overdrafted basins had submitted their groundwater sustainability plans. So we have those in hand now. In January of next year, we're gonna get those from the rest of the GSAs in high and medium priority basins. Over the next couple of years, the Department of, Department of Water Resources will evaluate and address issues in those plans. And then by 2040 to 42, basins are gonna have to achieve sustainability as defined in that uh, initial slide. So the way the GSA formation process works, I've talked about this a little already, is that those pre-existing local agencies with water and land use responsibilities form them either independently or jointly with a joint powers agreement or memorandum of understanding. And in those two latter collaborative cases, GSAs can involve board members that are not themselves local agencies. So people from a local farm bureau or environmental NGO can be given a board seat uh, in order to influence the decision making at that GSA. Uh, there are 224 distinct GSAs in state, 155 of which are just single agencies that have taken on the GSA mantle. And those that are collaborative, uh, the rest of those 224 have an average of 6.51 board seats. This pie chart breaks down who, uh, what organizations those board seats belong to. Um, and this treats those single GSAs as just having a single board seat belonging to that forming agency. So you can see the majority are special districts and local agencies, almost all of which are water districts, irrigation districts, reclamation districts, other districts that have a historic role in uh, delivering surface water supplies to agricultural users. So you can see why uh, these districts have a clear interest in the development of groundwater management policy. The next biggest are the cities and counties. Counties have a unique role under Sigma as the backstop GSA for any portion of a subbasin that doesn't organically have some other agency decide to become the GSA in that area. But both cities and counties are also involved in delivering water to municipal users. So also have a clear interest in how water management uh, happens. And the remaining seats belonging to people like domestic well holders or environmental NGOs make up a very small share of the total board seats on GSA boards, somewhat by design, since they can only be involved in these collaborative GSAs where they're invited by these local agencies. Uh, so those GSAs have to write groundwater sustainability plans, which have a lot that go into them, including a lot of very scientific technical description of the hydrogeography of the underlying aquifer, uh, which is important, but not something we're interested in or collecting data on. But what we're collecting data on is the management action section of the groundwater sustainability plan, which is a list of uh, the projects and plans that these agencies are developing that they're going to use to try to get groundwater extraction back to sustainable levels. So these can be kind of split into two big buckets. The first being supply augmentation, which is trying to find surface water supplies to recharge the aquifer with like storm water or wastewater or something like that. Basically every groundwater sustainability plan includes some amount of this. Um, it's very popular, but ultimately this is not going to cut it for most GSPs just because there is not an adequate amount of unaccounted for surface water necessary to deal with the entire scope of the unsustainable groundwater extraction problem. So that leaves the second bucket, which is demand management, just broadly meaning uh, any way that you can try to get people to consume less 
groundwater, uh, which I'm going to break that up further in these next few slides. But I do want to first emphasize that these GSPs don't give a final and complete list of actions, and the plans that we have looked at differ quite a lot in terms of how specific they are about what actions they're going to take, and also in terms of the degree of certainty. There's a lot of, we might do this, we might do that going on in the current plans. So the first uh, kind of command and control type demand management action you can take is an outright pumping restriction. Um, this is a map of the GSAs that have submitted GSPs so far. Um, and you can see the dark blue is places where pumping restrictions are being talked about as a possibility, the potential, and then the lighter blue are the ones that are saying, yes, there's going to be pumping restrictions. Although I want to uh, clarify that in both cases, uh, these pumping restrictions tend to be conditionally worded. So the pumping restrictions will only come into effect under drought conditions, for example, or uh, after 10 years, if we haven't hit some specific target, then we're going to implement pumping restrictions. So it's not like there's gonna be a bunch of restrictions day one, but also, I mean, droughts are when you want to have some flexibility in who's gonna get water. Because if you own you know, a young orchard that has 20 good years of life left in it, that's a super high value crop, a drought when you don't have access to enough water to keep that orchard alive is exactly when you don't want to have a very command and control type pumping restriction on how much water you can access. Uh, another type is fees. Um, you can see basically everywhere is at least considering some form of fees. Uh, and fees on groundwater extraction can be useful because historically, uh, California groundwater users have been able to pump as much groundwater, uh, well, maybe not quite as much as they want, but it's been very lax in terms of how much groundwater you can extract. And the only price for it in most of the state has been the price of the electricity required to run the pumps. So introducing a price on extraction itself can do things like incentivize, incentivize people to make uh, efficiency improvements, um, also reconsider crop choices. But unfortunately, not all of these fees are on groundwater extraction itself. There are lots of places considering things, fees on things like the amount of irrigated acreage, which has a much less tighter link to these kinds of um, decisions that might incentivize efficiency improvements, for example. Uh, next is allocation programs. So Sigma doesn't quite allow GSAs to create real property rights the way economists typically think of them over groundwater, uh, just because there's a lot of existing law that property rights, they can't just straight up assign property rights. But using the powers that Sigma grants GSAs, namely that they can restrict pumping at different levels for different people, as well as assess fees on extraction at different levels for different people, they're able to create some things that look a whole hell of a lot like property rights. So for example, giving each existing groundwater user some set allocation of water for which the groundwater extraction fee is going to be very, very low. And then once you reach that limit, the rate for your gr groundwater extraction after that goes way up is one way they might implement an allocation. So there's a lot of places talking about doing allocations, some with certainty, some are just talking about doing it potentially, um, but also allocations on their own only go so far. So again, if you're the orchard owner in a drought, if you have an allocation, that's great if it's enough water, uh, but if it's not enough water, you want to be able to trade with your neighbor who maybe is growing a low value crop like alfalfa or something in the field next door. Um, having allocations is great, but doesn't work if you don't have enough water, you'd like to be able to make some kind of trade. So the good news is that conditional on at least considering allocations, almost every GSA is at least considering also allowing trading. Um, but very few of them are communicating any degree of certainty in terms of, yes, we are going to implement trading. That would be the light green on this map. There's only a small handful uh, that are talking about it with any degree of certainty. So that's where groundwater markets currently are in uh, the Sigma governance process. So I hope that tees up some of this discussion about how ITQs have developed or markets and fisheries. Thank you.
Thank you, Arthur. That was a great summary and update for the Sigma. Uh, now we, we move to, to Kalyan that she is going to talk about uh, markets to manage fisheries and what we can learn to uh, for designing groundwater markets. Uh, Kalyan, if you want to go ahead and share uh, your slides. Um, And can you see that here? Yes, that's uh, yeah, that's good. perfect. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And Kalyan, to, to start, can you uh, tell us uh, why do you need markets to manage uh, fisheries? Uh, Yes, <laughs> I have a slide for that. Um, yeah, so you know, Arthur, I really appreciated the the background on Sigma there and the discussion around some of the design of the um, the sort of sub programs, I guess, within it. And so I thought I'd start off with a little bit of an overview and sort of fixing some of the terms that are really common uh, to fisheries because I, I think this is sort of an important thing for us to do here. Um, and so I'll talk a lot about catchers, and I think that this is a good term to use, especially given what I heard of your description of Sigma. So it's this broader term that is focused on allocation and trading to a certain extent, but that accommodates something beyond that sort of perfectly efficient market that you mentioned, Arthur, that I think as economists in particular, we, we always have in mind. And so this is sort of a catch-all term uh, referring to a lot of different rights-based uh, management program designs. And under that umbrella certainly is individual transferable quotas. And so in the fisheries context, we think of the total fish stock, we assess it, uh, we, uh, and usually more biologists or ecologists weigh in what's a sustainable uh, amount that can be extracted. That amount is allocated. Um, typically, if we're thinking of an ITQ program, we're thinking about a commercial fishery. So that is allocated to the commercial fishery sector. We usually call that allocation a total allowable catch. And then from there, it's allocated to individual fishers. And I think, Arthur, this really fits up, uh, fits nicely with Sigma. So there's an individual quota program. So this is where fishers get the allocation, but they can't trade it. And then we have the individual transferable quota programs, which has that last piece where fishers can actually uh, trade amongst themselves. So similar structure, I think, to, to what you've been talking about, but with some uh, just different terms and transferring over to fisheries context here. So when I think of uh, catch shares and markets in the fisheries context, I think the story is slightly different um, because to a certain extent, we can solve that biological problem independently um, or historically have looked at the biological or ecological issue independently from more of the economics of things. And so these total allowable catches uh, can ensure stock sustainability, um, but they can be enforced with a variety of different program designs. And so one of the more common ones is that uh, if you monitor dockside landings, you just close the fishery down once the sustainable catch is hit, no more fishing. That doesn't solve the economic problem, but certainly it, it has the capacity to sort of separate these two dimensions. And so when I think of why would you implement an ITQ or a catch share, um, I think of that as more resolving an economic problem. So in the absence of some kind of cooperation or management, we end up in this situation where we have uh, too much effort. So in the fisheries case, I think effort is multidimensional. So it's a little bit more challenging to think about in some ways. So we think of the number of vessels, fishing days, vessel capacity. So that effort is going to enter the fishery um, until profit is eroded. And so in the fisheries context, I think there's some nice analogies here to the water context. One of the, the big issues is the stock externality. And so, uh, you don't own the fish, you don't own the water until you're using it, until you've, you've got the fish on board. And so you'll fish because if you don't fish that fish, uh, your neighbor or somebody else out there is going to pick up that fish. There's also the, the issue in some fisheries uh, where the cost of fishing depends on the sort of density of the, the fish stock or the number of fish out there. And I think there's the analogy to groundwater and the pumping costs as the, as the levels change. And so uh, without management, without some kind of cooperation, uh, you end up in a situation with, uh, you know, eroded economic profit and potentially stock issues as well. And so this is the sort of common pool resource problem, the too many boats fishing, uh, too few fish problem. And so uh, ITQs are one way that uh, we can tackle the economic 
um, as well as uh, the biological um, the, the biological challenges here. Thank you, Kelly. And, and uh, what is the history of cash shares as a tool to manage fisheries? Um, yeah. Um, so I guess I, I've got, I think, one or two more slides <laughs> that may bridge these, these couple questions here. Um, so let me just touch on this really quickly. And I think Arthur was talking about this a little bit. So mm -hmm. allocating the shares, you can get rid of the race to fish or in the groundwater case, uh, you might resolve some of the common pool resource issue, but without that trading, I think you don't get the full efficiency gains. And that's true for the, the fisheries case as well. Um, and then I wanted to just touch on this question that I think is also very important as we think about porting over some of what we learned to the Sigma context. And that's, do we actually need markets to manage fisheries? And, uh, you know, when you look at a lot of Ostrom's work and some of the case studies, there's a lot of support for uh, shared community management as an effective strategy, uh, especially in smaller scale fisheries. And so I could see in, uh, uh, in groundwater context where the community is much smaller, maybe you don't need the infrastructure of a market. And so one of the things that we see in fisheries is this kind of bifurcation. So a lot of the small scale fisheries contexts are these great examples that are more sh shared community management. But then we see a lot more of the market-based programs, the ITQs in these cases where we have large commercial fisheries. So a lot of the work I do, a lot of the fisheries that I look at, there are thousands of participants. And so in cases like that, it's a lot harder to think of how shared community management could really work. So um, there have been a number of programs as sort of a, a backlash, I think, to this market uh, approach. We, we call these catch shares now a little bit in the US as a backlash <laughs> against the ITQs. So there have been these sort of more combined kind of uh, uh, programs. There's the, uh, there's the uh, Northeast Groundfish Sector Program. There's a couple in Chile and Peru. And what these programs did, they're, they're a bit of hybrid in the sense that um, the aggregate cap is set. Fishers are given uh, an allocation if they want to join the sector or this cooperative, they bring their allocation in. And then that sector or cooperative can decide how uh, to use that allocation, who would fish it. So if you value equity, if you value specific communities, you can push that allocation uh, there. And uh, what's happened though, again and again, if you actually go and talk to participants in these fisheries, is that they've essentially created many markets. And so it's a little bit more devolved, more decentralized, but effectively, uh, a lot of the allocation is moving within these sectors or cooperatives in more of a, a market structure. So now I think, Maddie, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get Thank into you. a little bit of the history here as well. Yes. And uh, I think this will dovetail nicely with some of what Arthur was talking about. Um, and so the, the history of fisheries, I think, <clears throat> is a little bit different in the sense that uh, you know historically there were the pure open access fisheries, no regulation at all. But then there was this move and sort of ecologists made this really persuasive argument. We've got to manage these stocks sustainably if we're going to have productive fisheries in the future. And so this is where you get into the regulated open access uh, management regimes where, um, where the, the catch is capped and the season might just be abbreviated. You shut down the fishery when the cap is met. There's these other more intermediate uh, type of program, restricted open access, where you restrict who can enter the fishery. Uh, and then we think of our more kind of traditional uh, rights-based programs. Um, the last sort of management institution progression, or last management institution that I've got up here on this progression is ecosystem-based fishery management, which is more of a, a new way of thinking. Um, just over the last few years, I feel like this has really been pushed. And so you can think of, um, you know, going from the pure open access to the rights base, you're sort of moving along this uh, property rights spectrum and increasing the property rights. Um, but then more recently, we've really been thinking 
uh, in the fishery space about expanding the scope or the scale of, of uh, the, uh, the um, management programs that we would use. So moving from beyond just a single fishery um, to more of an ecosystem scale. And I'll give some examples of that uh, later on. So in terms of the, the history um, worldwide here uh, and when these programs came into place, really in the 70s, I would say, a lot of catch shares started to take off. Um, and this, this figure here ends at 2017, I guess. But you know, I'd say at least uh, around 200 programs are in place worldwide today. Um, and across a range of different countries. So this is sort of counting the number of species by country. And uh, you know, one of the trends here you might see is that these tend to be implemented in more developed country contexts. And then finally, I just have a figure here showing um, that these are implemented in a variety of fisheries around the United States. And um, looking through this list, I would say most of our, or many of our higher value fisheries in the US are, are managed via catch shares. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Kellyanne. And uh, we have the question here, what are the some of successful and unsuccessful examples of uh, programs to manage fisheries and what make them successful or not? Um, yeah, let me jump in here. So I, I reframe this question a little bit because I think in the fisheries case, this is more a story of implementation. And so I wouldn't say there's been a program um, or at least it's very rare for these programs to be say so unsuccessful that they're removed. Generally, they might be slightly modified uh, once they're in place, but the real challenge is actually implementation. Um, and so, uh, um, I gave a little bit of a history here a few slides back, but this is one of the reasons we talk about catch shares instead of ITQs. There is some resistance to, uh, to more market-based approaches by fishers early on. And I think there, one of the problems was not enough sort of stakeholder involvement in, in some of the program designs. Um, but I think also incorporated in this word success is what are your objectives? So to measure the success of a program, I think we need to be really clear and articulate about what the objectives of the program um, are. And so as economists, I think we are, we are, are uh, prone to thinking of economic efficiency. But if you go through fisheries regulations, and you all can tell me more about the water context, the, the objectives of management are not just economic efficiency. So we sort of have this tool that is designed very well in terms of addressing economic efficiency. But then in reality, a lot of the goals of fishery management programs go beyond that. And so, uh, you know, there are a number of papers, economists I think have done a great job showing that these programs have tremendous benefits uh, from an economic efficiency perspective. We've seen, um, uh, seasons elongate, fishers can time their catch to when the market, the price is high. Um, it also has opened this opportunity of switching product forms. So maybe, uh, you know, some of these programs uh, uh, or fisheries used to stay open for just a couple days, like the halibut up in Alaska. And so there was a race to fish, everything got frozen. It was all sold into this lower value frozen market. And after the ITQ program went into place, then there's the, uh, the option to sell this higher value sort of fresh product form. So some of that profit um, and economic efficiency is generated through changes in, in product forms. There's been some other nice work um, uh, looking at safety benefits by Lisa, uh, who's a UC Davis graduate. Um, and then, you know, I think there have been these, these broader questions raised, though, about how to balance these more social oriented objectives with some of these economic efficiency objectives. And so I think this is something that people are thinking a lot about now. Um, and I, I think certainly you want to think about it in the context of the goals or objectives themselves. But then I think there's, there's this other reason to think about it, even if your goal is more efficiency oriented. And that's that if some of these social considerations are not uh, addressed, these programs can take even longer to get off the ground. And so every year you may be not implementing this program, you're missing out on the, the sort of profitability of each of these years. And so some of what's been uh, talked about um, and operationalized in the fishery space relates to 
well, what can we do to try to balance these different types of goals within this program structure? And so I think the first is the sort of obvious one to economists, which is redistribution. So design the program to be as efficient as you can, tax the profit, and then redistribute it to meet your social objectives. So in the fishery space, if it's community well-being, if it's keeping small scale fishers in the fishery, um, you know, what are the concerns that are sort of tied to that? Um, and in the case of this from COPE's program in Peru, some of what they did was allocate some of that tax to retraining, retirement incentives, and things like that to try to sort of ease the transition uh, into this new program structure. That's relatively rare, though. Um, a lot more common, and, and I think this, this might line up with some of what folks are thinking about in the Sigma space, is modifying the program design itself. So who's allocated allocations? I sort of what are the rules around that? One of the things we see a lot in the fisheries context is restrictions on trade. So quota or the allocation is given maybe to small scale fishers to different regions. That's something that I think I heard Arthur talk about um, in the Sigma context. There's been allocations to communities themselves. And then there's uh, sometimes some additional flexibility built in. So maybe can you go over <laughs> a little bit one year and then pay it back the next or vice versa? Um. Yeah, thanks, Kellyanne. And what are some of the spillover effects of cash shares? When we talk about Sigma, this question comes up a lot. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. And it's interesting to me that's something that you all are thinking about in the Sigma context, because I, I feel like this is something that we're just thinking about recently in, in the fishery space. And uh, this was sort of motivated first by ecologists who have this more systems approach to what's happening under the water and thinking about sort of a, a food web. Um, and there's been this push to sort of increase the scope of management program uh, design and evaluation. And so um, when, when I showed those other slides, a lot of uh, showing the catch shares that have been implemented in the world, a lot of them are single fishery uh, specific. So the Alaska halibut, for example. Um, so that would be specific to a particular fishery. But now there's this push to think beyond just one fishery to think more at an ecosystem um, scale and acknowledge some of the connectivity that exists um, uh, between these different um, uh, ecosystem components and then uh, sort of segmenting that into more ecological and human there. And so uh, some of the work that, that um, I've been involved in has, has looked at this question. And so the basic idea is that you could implement one of these programs in a particular location, a particular target fishery, that fishers and vessels may respond and change their effort. So they might exit and go somewhere else. Um, they might increase the day's fish, their catch in another fishery. And so you might be thinking, well, you know, I did a, a great job in this particular fishery increasing economic efficiency or whatever your goals are. But maybe you're generating this externality somewhere else. And so you've essentially resulted in effort shifting into another fishery and maybe decreasing the economic efficiency or sort of creating another issue over there. And so this is the, the sort of idea of uh, spillover that's um, emerged in the fisheries context. And so there's some work by uh, Marty Smith and some co-authors um, showing that spillover happened with the New England groundfish sector um, program, so from, uh, uh, from the Northeast down to the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and then some of my own work, we looked in the Alaska region after these catch shares were implemented. What we saw was that uh, depending on the fishery characteristics, there was sort of more or less of this spillover, but that indeed these fisheries are connected and so looking on just sort of a single fishery basis, um, you, you, you may be missing some really important externalities and potential efficiency gains. Th thanks very much, Kellyanne. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's in line with what um, we are thinking about Sigma. And, and same here, when, when we talk about designing groundwater markets, uh, there are talks that it can have a positive or negative effects on, on local communities. What do you see uh, these effects are in, in cash shares. Uh, 
Yeah. So one of the one of the big first things is that uh, these we call them quota and fisheries, but you get that initial allocation and it's an asset. Um, and so there's that sort of first generation, and we heard this in Peru a lot when we visited and we're evaluating their, um, their catch share program there. Overnight, there are millionaires in some of their communities. This asset is worth a lot and fishers can sell it. Uh, and you know, it sort of really changes their personal portfolio. But then some of the challenges arise and we're hearing that a lot now in the fisheries context. So remember these have been in place since the 70s, 80s and a lot, there was that kind of huge spike in the 90s. And so as, as this new generation of fishers is weighing whether or not um, to, or new generation of potential fishers is weighing whether or not to fish, now we've run into this problem of uh, fishers needing access to capital to buy an asset to fish. And so what does that really mean in terms of who has access to this fishery? So it's got to be somebody that has access to capital can, or can at least get a loan or something. And so I think from an equity perspective, that's raising um, some flags for folks. I think the other thing that's really important to think about from a community impact perspective is this sort of double-edged sort of consolidation. And so as we remove excess capacity and effort from the fishery to make things more economically efficient, what we're actually doing is we're taking, uh, uh, we're taking uh, and changing the nature of fishery labor across these communities. And so, yes, we're increasing uh, the profitability for some, um, but these may be very geographically concentrated. And so there may be some distributional aspects to think about uh, across the, the fisheries or across the fishing communities. Um, and I, I think this, this can really be framed as this sort of economic efficiency versus uh, more kind of community well-being trade-off uh, in many contexts. And here in the US in the fisheries case, uh, we're pretty explicit national standard eight of the Magnus and Stevens Acts commits us to supporting fishing dependent communities. And so we're supposed to be thinking about those communities when we make uh, management policy design. Thanks, uh, Kalyan. And what are some of the lessons about compliance with cash shares that are useful for designing groundwater markets? Uh, yeah, so one thing that uh, that we found in the fisheries space is that these catch share programs do tend to increase the cost of management. So you can think, I mean, somebody has to do that sort of catch quota reconciliation. <laughs> Someone's got to keep track of all this stuff. So there's sort of the administrative side. There's the research side. So how do we design these programs? How do how are they working? Um, we need to understand that. And then there's the, the sort of day-to-day -day surveillance and enforcement. And so, you know, conceptually you're increasing profit, but I think a really important question is, you know, does this cover the management costs? And generally, if you looked at this from sort of a cost benefit analysis uh, framework perspective, yes, it does. Um, but I also think it favors larger fisheries. And this is back to an earlier slide where I kind of drew that contrast between some of the smaller scale fisheries, where I think a lot of the Ostrom kind of work is really relevant, and then some of the larger scale commercial fisheries, uh, where I think markets are a better fit. And, you know, one of the reasons um, is, is this here. One of the other things that um, that I heard when uh, I visited Chile and Peru and was talking about their program, they have something similar to the Northeast sectors. So it's this kind of hybrid where the, the uh, uh, participants join these cooperatives. And so one of the advantages we heard was that all the movement of quota or allocation within the cooperative was managed by the cooperative. So there's that kind of devolved administrative cost. And then the government tracks just the aggregate and trades between these different groups. So I think that's something to think about. And then the last thing I want to flag uh, on the enforcement and monitoring side is the equity implications. And so I've got some pictures up here. Uh, a lot of the enforcement and monitoring in these early catch share programs um, and just fishing in general in the US, there's a fixed cost of onboard observers. And so the, the first generation of this kind of enforcement and monitoring is someone physically goes on the boat and watches as you said, you pull up your catch. But if you can think about, uh, you know, a really small boat versus a really big boat, uh, you both just need one observer usually. 
And so that kind of fixed cost really favors larger boats, larger operations. And so uh, in, the, in the fisheries case, technology has sort of emerged as a solution and there's electronic monitoring options now where there's cameras that are motion censored that when, uh, when you go to pull the catch up, we'll, we'll, monitor, um, we'll monitor it. Thanks, Kenyan. These, these are very interesting. And um, yeah, again, when we talk about designing groundwater markets, we talk about um, collaboration among agencies. Did, did, can you tell us some of the success stories that uh, you have from, from fisheries markets on, on, on collaboration among the agencies? Yeah, I, here I wasn't able to find, I think, as, as great parallels, I think, to the water context as, as uh, to some of your other questions. But um, the way things th tend to work in fisheries is that, you know, you can have this bottom up um, management. This is more of the Ostrom style. Um, this could be brought about by uh, individuals themselves. I think this generally is an area that we could really improve on. So. You know, when I think of bioeconomic analyses, the, the list of papers is sort of endless, but I think we've done a lot less in terms of cooperation with other social scientists. And so really trying to understand when can individuals come together, how can individuals come together um, to implement this more kind of co-management type approach um, versus when do we want to think about these more kind of top down uh, management uh, approaches. And what we've seen in the US um, tends to be this more sort of top-down approach, especially in a lot of our more valuable um, fisheries. And so, um, you know, sort of segmenting things between, well, individual users can come together and collaborate versus, um, you know, here in the US, I think the discussion more is around getting different stakeholder groups to the table and developing management programs. And so, um, Fisheries in the U.S. is already somewhat devolved, so uh, the U.S. has a number of different regions, and those fishery management councils are responsible for designing those programs. And there is generally uh, um, stakeholder input into that process, and sort of a, a process that includes stakeholders there. Um, but then, you know, I think that um, as we look at uh, species themselves as we broaden this kind of scope of management. We can think about other cases where there would or maybe wouldn't be collaboration. And so certainly in the US, I see instances where, you know, the TA, the to total allowable catch is set jointly between different sectors and maybe those are different types of stakeholders, so commercial or recreational. Um, there's some collaboration between these different regional uh, councils to undertake the stock assessments. Um, and then I thought of a, you know, another example. So sometimes countries will jointly manage uh, or assess the stock and allocate uh, catch. Um, so, you know, Alaska and Canada do that with their halibut. But overall, this seems to be like an area where I just saw fewer parallels versus some of the other questions that, that you raised. Thanks very much, uh, Kalyan. Uh, this was very interesting, informative uh, uh, to all the attendees. If you have any questions for Kalyan, please submit it through the Q&A uh, box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, now I turn the, uh, the stage to, to Ellen and, and Jamie for their discussion. Yeah, thanks, Mehdi. Thank you so much, Kalyan. That was really great, um, really informative. I think there are a lot of lessons we can take from fisheries and, and thinking about groundwater market design. In California under Sigma. So really happy to have uh, Jamie Workman here with us to talk about just that. Um, Jamie, would you mind just starting with like, you know, high level, what is AquaShares? And we can go into some of the more details about AquaShares approach um, in a minute, but um, would you mind just giving us, um, you know, telling us what AquaShares is, is and then maybe kick us off with um, sort of telling from your point of view, uh, telling us what some of the similarities you see between groundwater and fisheries that has, you know, inspired sort of AquaShare's approach. Absolutely. Um, and let me know if you can't hear me, but uh, Ellen, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, AquaShare's is a small firm that uh, designs and operates uh, water savings markets. And it grew not out of a sort of an economic theory or, or 
uh, out of a, you know, how do we, how do we make money off this, but out of an anthropological understanding of our relationship to natural resources, especially in relationship to water and fisheries. And the parallels uh, driving both of them is, is, is going to be a great segue, I, I think, from, from Kaylin. Um, because they both are informed and basically, you know, in terms of a philosophy, we worship at, at the altar of, uh, of Eleanor Ostrom. And I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but in terms of your first question, you know, on the surface, these are two totally different uh, economies, two totally different resources. One's, you know, 200 nautical miles offshore. The other's hundreds or thousands of feet above sea level. Uh, you've got these two different resources. Fish, we're going to produce them to eat them, and water is more a means to an end of, of producing food, of producing uh, energy, and so forth. Um, and then you've got this other culture of wild capture in a matter of hours or days versus the sort of planned cultivation uh, over months or years. But when you do scratch the surface, they come down to these same questions of who owns this wild resource before it's, before it's brought to the surface for economic use. And, how much do we need to extract from nature or can we leave behind? And where should the value of these benefits flow as a priority? And these, as Kaylin said, have, have you know, subject for a lot of back and forth, a lot of tension, uh, a lot of evolution. Um, and how do we feed you know, our growing human appetite with this wild resource that is, and this is both of them, finite or shrinking, it's renewable, it's invisible until it's hauled up to the surface, it's a fugitive resource and that it, you know, frustratingly doesn't stay put. Uh, there's this great saying of, you know, managing fish is just like managing forests, except unlike trees, fish move and they eat each other and they reproduce. And water has got a similar kind of complexity of what's, what's it doing down there uh, under the earth where we can't see it. And yet it is, you know, worthless in its wild state and priceless in captivity. And if we take more than you know, the, the, the resource can bear more than its carrying capacity. We put too many boats on the water, uh, catching too much fish too fast. It's the same thing as putting too many straws in that aquifer milkshake. It leads to collapse um, in many ways, quite literally. Um, and I like this map just to sort of show things. I want you to look at California as one of the first areas to really start exploiting its fisheries. Look what happens in 1976 with the passage of Magnuson-Stevens Act. Absolutely nothing. You've got this regulatory force, this landmark put in place to say, okay, we're going to manage fisheries, and the depletion did not stop. In many ways, it got accelerated and it got worse. We see a similar kind of thing where we can understand, you know, what's going on uh, beneath the surface. GRACE is this fantastic, you know, satellite-driven uh, technology that measures, you know, how far is, is the depletion happening? Where is it happening? And yet that doesn't really equip us with the tools to deal with this, to stop this you know, depletion, to, to slow and, and reverse even uh, the, the overpumping of aquifers and the overextraction uh, of, of fisheries. So this is all sort of the usual doom and gloom. And as a journalist for many years, I, I thrived on that. I was like, oh, look how stupid this is. Oh, we're, we're you know, killing the golden goose. But then I started to say, okay, let's look at some exceptions. Let's find places where it's working, where people aren't over-exploiting their resources. And this took me to one of the hottest, driest places on earth in the Kalahari Desert of Southern Africa, where the Bushmen have been you know, managing their resources, uh, if you put it that way, uh, for thousands of years, despite no standing water. Uh, their system was called Taro. Uh, and I learned from them how they truck barter and exchange these resources and turn scarcity into abundance and, and potential conflicts over those resources uh, into cooperation. And I wrote this book about it and, and uh, it sold 27 copies and, and uh, so forth. But what I learned afterwards was that it wasn't just the Bushmen. Hundreds of societies around the earth from the, the Arabian Peninsula to Morocco to uh, then Persia, modern Iran, um, for hundreds or thousands of years had these systems called subak or aflaj or ketera or kanat that were devolved, decentralized, self-organizing, self-management systems where everyone had skin in the game. Everyone had an incentive to use that resource efficiently because if they didn't use up their share, they could barter and trade with someone else who didn't. Um, and, and those work. And they're still working to this day on, on the scale. 
then I spent several years, you know, I had a, the good fortune of working for Environmental Defense Fund uh, with this guy, Buddy Gwinden, uh, who's one of the, the highliners in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico of Red Snapper and, and, and Grouper. And he was dead set against this whole ITQ catch share system because he figured, oh man, I, I got a good deal going. I'm catching the most fish here. This is just a way to you know, screw me over and redistribute the, the, the wealth for me. And he was one of the people who had depleted that fishery more than anyone. But as it evolved, as things unfolded, as the votes went against him, he realized, geez, this is a good, a good system. It's gonna work out for me. It changed his incentives. Uh, and as Kalen said, it made him uh, a millionaire overnight. What it also did in the process was it made him, gave him these incentives to hold back, to slow the slaughter of what was going on, him and hundreds of other fishermen in the Gulf to change their ways. And while this was a modern you know, instrument, uh, it's important for us to remember that these kinds of catch share, these co-management systems, they weren't just invented in the 60s or 70s or 80s. Some of them, again, go back hundreds of years uh, in Fiji and Palau, uh, off the, the coast of, of Turkey uh, and India, and the traditional customary systems of, of rights based management among people who were illiterate and innumerate, and yet they managed their fisheries in a way that is just extraordinary and complex and diverse. So the question for us, for AquaShares, and I think for all of us on this webinar is, okay, that's great. That's very quaint and all these, these traditional systems that worked for hundreds of years, but we've only got 15, 20 years max to be able to comply with these new you know, things crashing down on our heads of Sigma. How are we gonna make that work? It's not just a, a matter of a small little watershed or aquifer in the Arabian Peninsula. We're talking you know, hundreds, even thousands of square miles. Uh, of, of productive agricultural lands. Um, so how do you scale that up in time and in space? And our approach was like, okay, well, let's, let's look at what te technology can do. We're not gonna be carrying water. We're not gonna be diverting physical wet water, but we can monitor these credits and let people trade what they save. And we started this proof of concept. We cheated a little bit. We worked where there was existing institutions, namely utilities that depended on groundwater. Uh, first in Sonoma, uh, and later uh, in Marrakesh, Morocco. Uh, and what we wanted to show is like, what do people do? Do their behavior change when they've got skin in the game, when they've got a stake in the outcome? And sure enough, working with the California Water Foundation, Valley of the Moon, Sonoma Water, it did. And then in Morocco, same thing. They didn't have a screen and so forth. They worked off text messages once a month. But once again, the, the, the group that was participating saved a lot of water. The question now, bringing it to, to groundwater, in both cases, in both Sonoma and in Morocco, they said, well, this is great, but urban water only uses a fraction of that groundwater. Can you extend this? Can you expand these principles, this system, this platform to groundwater as well? And I'll, I'll stop there basically using these, these same principles. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so, so in what ways, I guess more specifically, has the AquaShares approach been shaped by, you know, what, what we've learned from fisheries management, tragedy of the commons, work of Eleanor Ostrom that you mentioned before? Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, we, we worship uh, at the altar of, of, of Lynn Ostrom. And the reason we do is because, you know, the, the real tragedy for us, as we learn this more and more, is that we often now associate, thanks to Garrett Hardin's work, uh, we associate the commons with something bad, with something sinister, with something weak. Um, and his, uh, you know, his solution was like, oh, commons are generic, they're monolithic, they're weak and simplistic, uh, it's sort of like a bumper sticker, the tragedy of the commons when, when you read that. And the only solutions are these top-down centralized um, uh, regulatory crackdowns. Um, and uh, what Ostrom gave us back was this recognition that that commons are unique, they're nuanced, contours, they're, uh, uh, they have you know, a fascinating history and they're a collection um, not of you know, autonomous atoms bumping into each other, but a, a communion of subjects, of people who come to the table and say, we got a problem, we got to work this out. You know, how are we going to do this? Uh, and finding, as she did in fisheries and in groundwater, I think groundwater was her thesis, uh, um, and you know, how, how do people resolve these, these challenges? And they don't just sort of deplete the resource, they figure out ways to put restrictions on themselves. And it's a messy, complex process, as she says, and it's the worst kind of management except for all the others. Uh, and we've taken that, and as I said, from, from EDF has built on these lessons. Um, 
and uh, applied them to natural resource problems, especially with fisheries. And they learned these lessons and said, okay, instead of you know, putting these onerous top-down controls on you can only fish Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays of saying, you know, wait, let's, or, or you can only use this size motor or this mesh net or this kind of equipment. They trusted and worked with the fishermen to say, look, you, you need to make a profit. What if we, and we need to make sure the resource isn't depleted. What if here's the scientific threshold, you get these quotas and how you catch that is up to you. Uh, but we're gonna be watching, we're gonna have monitoring, we're gonna have enforcement. Um, and that changed the dynamic 100% uh, where they felt trusted, where they felt there was incentives and where they knew there was gonna be, they're gonna be held accountable uh, to, to meeting that. Um, I won't go too much into this, but it's a one way of thinking of this inclusive allocation process, which is you know 70, 80% of the time going into, into catch shares is saying, okay, how do you set that initial allocation? Who gets to participate? Um, one of the reasons that went from individual transferable quotas to, to catch shares or sustainable management and ecosystem management is a recognition that fishing does impact more than just you know, individual fishermen. It, it, it involves the coastal community. It involves the processors. It involves the recreational fishermen, the subsistence fishermen. Uh, and what's been fascinating to me is seeing how over time, these catch share systems do adapt, they do evolve, they create this wealth by restoring the fish, and then they bring more and more participants into it, new entrants. Um, uh, as, as Kaylin said, you need to have some loan programs, but the people who are actually loaning you know, money or share to new fishermen are the people who actually have shares of the fish because they wanna make sure that there's an, a new generation to come along and participate. Same with Alaska, uh, the communities uh, that she mentioned, some of the coastal communities are among those that are generating and benefiting from that wealth. So there's this make, making sure it's an inclusive process that, that is equitable. Um, Kaylin mentioned this as well on, on, on fishing boats of saying, okay, we can now have these electronic monitoring that's an expensive upfront cost, but boy, it saves a lot of time, energy, tensions and so forth. Um, if you get everybody to buy into it. And it has to be all or nothing. It can't just be, oh, well, we're going to have observers on two thirds of the boats and the other third is sort of wild west. Make sure that everybody agrees on the terms and the, and the conditions uh, of compliance. And again, what's fascinating is that fishermen, probably second only to farmers, are very, very guarded with their privacy. They don't want anyone to know when they're fishing, where they're fishing, how deep they're fishing, what gear they're using. Uh, until they have a secure share of the resource uh, in the water. And once that happens, they wanna make sure that everybody's playing by the same rules and they know that if they can't cheat, that guy over there 20 miles away and whatever he's doing in his fishing boat can't cheat. And they start to move towards sharing of data. Um, and that's the, the, the magical element of trust uh, that is a key part of this. Um, divesting your share, uh, you know, granted, it's it's like, is it need to be what kind of a market, what kind of transactions, any market or transactions at all? The main thing, whether it's a traditional fishery, like you know, going back uh, centuries uh, or traditional water system, is that you need to be able to pass down your share to someone else. And if you can't do that, then you have every incentive still to exploit it um, uh, while you're while you're alive, because then it just goes back to someone else. And that's human nature. And that's that's certainly a challenge in terms of the nuances of that. But when you do have that long-term incentive, um, it's amazing. The fishermen started saying, you know, we used to fight the regulators saying, here's the catch limit and say, no, 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 that's too low. Now we're fighting the regulators saying that catch limit is too high. We, we want it to be lower um, so that it will recover faster because we're looking five, 10, 15 years down the road. And that's one of the reasons why it has been so effective. I want to tip my hat again to another UC branch. It's not part of the three here, but to UC Santa Cruz, uh, where um, Chris Costello and Steve Gaines had worked with uh, EDF to sort of model out this extraordinary, you know, understanding of what would happen uh, if catch shares were implemented uh, in different parts of the world, uh, especially in some of the key places. If the, if the California model was expanded and the business as usual, you know, continued depletion. Even you know traditional management or regulatory crackdowns weren't going to be as effective uh, as the catch share model, and that's given us you know inspiration and and, and hope. Great, thanks, Jamie. 
Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of things that, that came up in Caitlin's talk as well, like the stakeholder engagement and the importance of that in, in sort of designing it and, and like this adaptive market design um, and transparency and that sort of thing. So I'm curious if you could elaborate more on sort of how some of these concepts really manifest in practice and like, you know, sort of walk us through AquaShare's approach from design to allocation to operation and how do these these lessons from fisheries really manifest in, in, yeah. in the process. Oh, great. I mean, honestly, we, uh, we, we relied pretty heavily on uh, the an Environmental Defense Fund approach uh, to fisheries management because they had to sort of scale up really quickly um, the lessons from Eleanor Ostrom and these traditional fisheries and so forth over decades or centuries. Um, and how do we how do we do this uh, in a, a you know, way that is rigorous and yet flexible, that allows for breathing room, it still moves, you know, the process in the right direction. And, and this is important uh, for every GSA, you know, as they're not just as they're putting their GSP together, but saying, okay, we've got to go from, you know, this level of pumping and extraction to this level. How do we do that in a way that's fair, um, that's compliant, that's, uh, you know, keeps people at the table, that avoids lawsuits, um, uh, that protects groundwater dependent ecosystems, that includes disadvantaged communities, uh, all these challenges that are you know, driving people um, uh, up the wall and bringing them to each other's throats of saying, there is a way forward. And uh, so we borrowed from uh, Environmental Defense Fund's uh, approach, this, this seven step process, um, where you start, and, and the order is really important. Most people want to jump ahead to What's my allocation? How much water do I get? Uh, when do I start trading? What's that water going to be worth? To so say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's define what the market goals are. Um, do we want to have a purely export economy? Is it going to be 100% agricultural? Or do we have social values? And when we started doing this, it was like, oh, we actually want to preserve the rural character uh, of our county. We really think we need to set aside some for uh, tourism because the benefits from, from coming to visit these trees that are found nowhere else are essential. Okay, let's let's mark that down. Okay, let's quantify the resource. And there's like, well, we've got a shallow aquifer, we've got a deep aquifer, we've got a confined aquifer. Let's map those out. The hydrologists have done a lot of that work, but it still has some bearing of like, do you include the water upstream in the watershed that flows down? Or is it just within the boundaries there? Um, oh, that's a good point. Let's look at that. Okay, well, who gets to participate uh, in this in this system? Well, everyone, no, well, maybe not everyone. And we are just guiding this process. So they say, wait, if you don't have a well, what's your stake in the game? Somebody says, well, I'm an environmentalist. That's my stake in the game. Or someone else says, you know, I'm a social advocate. I wanna make sure I can afford to live here. That's my stake in the game. So you work through these things and then you start to define the allocations uh, of, all right, to get to these goals, to make sure you're including these participants in this resource here's some of your options uh, of allocations and here's how you can assign them. Here's how they can, how long they can last. Here's what happens if there's, you know, some water left over or, you know, building on the fisheries that aren't caught and then determining the platform requirements. What do you guys need to do to, to see, to know, to have confidence that someone else isn't cheating and that you're playing by the rules. And so everyone's playing by the rules or that the system is working for you. And this last one is really important as well, of evaluating and monitoring the performance of the markets, that it's not just a once off, boom, done, that you have this room to evolve, to adapt, to uh, improve the system based on what you learn from each year, that each, you know, each day, each week, each month informs the next. Um, and this basically led us, uh, and I'll talk about that later, in, into developing an 80-page uh, uh, design manual of how can a GSA uh, use this approach in a very structured and rigorous manner that doesn't force anything, that keeps people at the table? It's based on these you know, four principles of, of participant established rules, of clearly defined share allocations, of transparent accountability, and making sure that this is uh, equitable and local uh, trading, that you don't have some speculator in New York that's going to be jumping in uh, and participating and, and skewing the outcomes. Um, Again, learning from, from Eleanor Ostrom that the process, it's a messy process, it's a difficult process, it's contentious, and it's, it's, it's the best way uh, possible moving forward. That you need to have a diverse group sitting at the table, 
bickering with each other, hashing these things out, slamming their hands on the table, storming out of the room, but then storming back in because there's really no other alternative um, of how they defined uh, and you know can defend and, and divest uh, of these shares. Um, working that out through this open and inclusive and based on goals and rights uh, driven process that looks at the place that keeps all the stakeholders uh, in mind and, and you're looking at a map and say, okay, where can and can't we uh, uh, you know, clarify some of these shares? This will look familiar, uh, making sure that there are concentration caps if desired uh, so that no single sector or no single individual can dominate the market can um, can make sure that there's you know no one else can can get their shares and so forth making sure that there's social set asides and reserves um, and includes non-commercial non-agricultural institutions and finally this is the the equivalent of those onboard monitoring of of making sure that the meters are in place that people know how much they're using how much others are using and that this process is transparent that there's feedback loops so that you can ensure that you're improving that. And again, going to that divestiture of making sure that I, if we do this now, if we get this right, if, if we you know, hold back over the next couple of years, we're gonna have more water to use in the future. And that's gonna give us ever more flexibility. And it's gonna be a lot better than all these other alternatives like importing water or desalinating water or treating water um, that, that are, are on the table now. Great, thank you, Jamie. Just one last question and um, then we can open up to audience Q&A. Um, I'm curious if you could elaborate on, on some of your experience so far with groundwater markets, sort of um, if, it, if you have any um, successful collaborations with among various agencies and stakeholders um, that you could share with us today. Yeah, thanks, Alan. I, I mean, uh, Sonoma was our best um, and, and most uh, involved process coming out of the initial, the urban system there, uh, Sonoma County Water Agency, and uh, they had some very progressive and diverse uh, stakeholders that were already looking at this problem. And so they called us and said, look, you know, is this something that you can help us with? And we sat down with this diverse group that had been, you know, they knew each other, um, you know, from, from, from meeting occasionally, just sort of Trying to figure these things out, and and the the questions that they brought up are the kinds of questions that you know we we sort of anticipated, but then there's a lot of new ones. Uh, generally, they say, you know, does your system do this? Um, does your software, you know, result in that? How do you guys determine the price? How long do your percentage shares last? And the main point for for this constituency is to say we don't do anything. Our software doesn't do anything. The market, the software. The system, the design process is just a means to an end. You guys got to decide what that end is. And that sort of threw them back for a second because that's something they, they had in mind maybe in their head, but they hadn't really hashed out together of what they want that water to be used for, how they want to give it the most value, social value, environmental value, uh, economic value, political value. Um, the large, you know, fifth generation uh, agriculture uh, irrigator, Jim Bunshu, um, you know, came in this really kind of skeptical, really not, not hostile or anything. He's like open to this, but he had questions about transparency. It was just like, geez, you know, is this going to let everybody know how much water I'm using? Am I going to get a black eye? But over time, he started to say, you know, this is actually a way of building trust. And that trust is much more important uh, in the long term that I want to know who else is out there what the rules are, how they're being complied with, um, and, uh, and preventing others from cheating. And that way I know if I can't cheat, others can't cheat as well. Um, the, the ecology, the, the environmental, local environmental group, you know, had a very strong say, is this gonna just, you know, set aside those groundwater dependent ecosystems? And there definitely were some tensions between the producers and the environmentalists on this. But when they started looking and hashing out the details and looking at their goals of, the timing of extraction, the locations of extracting, they found that there was a lot more flexibility built in uh, and open to them that they could build on. Um, again, uh, uh, Fred was a great social advocate saying, look, I'm a renter here. I've seen prices go up on everything. Is water now going to be the last thing that pushes me out, uh, out on the streets? Um, can you design a system that incorporates the needs of people like me, of 
uh, of farm workers, of, of migrants, of uh, uh, others that disadvantaged communities. And we started working on that. Again, the commercial guys were, oh, I don't know about this until they started looking at the needs. And it was a rounding error for some of them to say, oh yeah, no, we can definitely include that as part of the outcome. Um, and finally, the family farmers, and this is an important uh, parallel with, with fisheries that I don't think we'd really gotten into, is that you, know, you often think of recreational fishermen uh, as a small component compared to the huge commercial fishermen. But in a lot of fisheries now, it's about 50-50, if not you know, more people, more fish taken by recreational fishermen. In Sonoma, this was a case that I think we're starting to see of these decentralized well owners that maybe only use two to five or six uh, acre feet a year, but in aggregate eat up a lot of the basin's groundwater supply uh, and they may be de minimis. And so how do they get incorporated? Do they want to be incorporated and have an opportunity to benefit from using less? Uh, who speaks for them? Um, and bringing that into the equation was also essential. Finally, there's it's not all parallels, you know, fish, uh, there may be hundreds of different species, different re reproduction uh, uh, rates and so forth. And that was a complexity along California's coast that the catch shares adapted and worked out. Similarly, in, in groundwater, you have the different levels, the different spatial impacts uh, of uh, hydrologically connected or disconnected uh, aquifers and needing to define and adapt your trading pools, your, your capacity to those. Um, again, just building back on these, these lessons learned uh, through this process, Ostrom, yep, <laughs> she's, she's right for us to, to, to sort of use her as the, as the, as the guiding force. Um, there is a strong analogy. Uh, we were able to borrow a lot of the lessons and processes and steps and timetables and principles from uh, catch share market design uh, for, for groundwater. And yes, setting that share allocation is going to be contentious, but you know, we have at least now this foundation that, as Kaylin said, has worked in 200 cases around the world. Um, uh, you've got share allocation solutions uh, that can minimize the conflict, and then you can have this transparent process for uh, operating that, that market. Thanks for, thanks for this. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, I'm going to hand it over now for Brittany to Brittany, who's going to uh, manage some of the Q&A. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions. If anybody else in the audience has um, questions for any of the panelists, um, feel free to enter them in the Q&A. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, we had a couple of questions from Emmanuel, who has now logged off, but hopefully he will access um, the recording after this. Um, so his original question was for Arthur, but I think probably um, uh, you all may be able to contribute to this. Um, so he says, you suggested a fee for managing groundwater basins, uh, essentially implying that it serves as an extraction cost or fee. How would you set it up? Would it serve as a price floor for groundwater trading? For groundwater, we know that there is a marginal user cost reflecting the intertemporal opportunity cost of groundwater use. So we'll go ahead and start with Arthur. Do you have any um, response to that? And then people can add in. Um. Yeah, I'll say in terms of optimal management, there's a lot of different ways that you can set up a basin or at least optimal in the sense that economists think about it in terms of economic efficiency. We've certainly heard there's plenty of other considerations too, but you know, in theory, you can set a fee at the right amount that will uh, incentivize just the right amount of efficiency improvements and things like that that can bring a groundwater basin back into sustainability. Or you can do that with other tools like allocations and trading and might not need to impose any outright fee whatsoever. But in terms of how fees are actually being used under Sigma, uh, first I want to say that a lot of these GSPs are really vague about A, what exactly the fee is going to be based on and also what level it's going to be set at. But it's also quite clear that many of the GSAs are using fees. They're not thinking of fees primarily as a way of incentivizing reductions in extraction by imposing a price on extraction, although that might be a secondary benefit. But they're thinking of them largely as just a way of raising funds in order to support the administrative tasks of the GSAs, which as Caitlin mentioned, you know, there's, there's administrative costs associated with the types of 
uh, actions that these GSAs are going to be undertaking. So I think that explains why we see a lot of these fees being levied on things like irrigated acreage or even just planted acreage, not even irrigated acreage, that have a much looser connection to extraction itself. Great. Thanks, Arthur. Do you have, uh, Jamie or Kaylin, do you have anything to, to add to that? I, I would add a little bit that um, a fee is economically an effective tool, and it's, it can be a political suicide uh, as well, that uh, unilaterally imposing a fee that you know, economists tell you is, you know, we'll get the results you want, it, it, it will, will generate backlash, and it ironically will generate backlash among the lower water users. Um, we've seen this uh, at the urban level for, for, for decades uh, that, you know, raising the price of water from um, 50 cents a, a, a cubic meter to 55 cents a cubic meter can, can topple a government. Um, I've actually seen it in a town that I, I lived in. I tried to warn them and they said, nope, we need to raise some revenues. We're gonna double the, the rates and that whole board was voted out the, the, the next election on that issue. Um, so it is an effective tool, but you often, that's one of the reasons you don't see economists running for office uh, on a, you know, vote for me and I will raise fees uh, across the board. Um, what I, what I, you know, think is that if you can get the same results, uh, and this is one of the reasons why there's, you know, movement towards or embracing cap and trade instead of a carbon tax, even though the carbon tax may be more efficient, is that it, it encourages uh, innovation, not just efficiency. It encourages investment of people looking, uh, you know, a few years down the road, if they have some stake in the outcome, if they can benefit from it instead of just, you know, paying the, the price of, of, of what they're already using. Okay, great. All right, we'll um, move on to Emmanuel's second question, which is um, for Caitlin, but again, I think um, probably Jamie can add, add to this as well. Um, we have been trained as economists to look at economic efficiency, at least from an academic purview. On the ground though, as we engage with stakeholders, we are often asked to address equity or distributional issues or questions as well. Um, and some of our policies mandate us to do so. Can I ask how we balance that out, balancing the needs and demands of everyone else's while meeting our policy goals? Is there anything we can learn from the fishery economics literature? How does groundwater market do that? Um, any best practices that you would suggest? There's a lot of questions in there, so. <laughs> there are a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure uh, I can remember them all off the top of my head, but let me dig in a little bit and then maybe Jamie will jump in after me. Um, I guess just a couple of big picture points. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for economists to collaborate more with non-economist social scientists. And so not to think that we really have the answer here just by ourselves, but that this might be a really good opportunity for more sort of interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, in my own experience, and I, I think this would be borne out um, sort of searching through the fishery literature, these are harder things to quantify sometimes. And I think they're, they're hard for other non-economist uh, social scientists to quantify. And so uh, I think sort of by nature, these are, these are harder things to assess versus something like, you know, ecology goals, what's a sustainable fish stock level or something like that. And so I think these are, are more challenging in some ways. Um, I think that economists do have a lot to add to this space in the sense that I think a lot of the modeling approaches that economists use can be used to inform um, some of the, the really hard questions that policymakers are facing. And I guess in framing my answer that way, I would also emphasize that, you know, I don't think that economists necessarily need to say, here's the answer, but that there's a lot of power in some of the tools that economists have developed over time to better articulate what the trade-offs are between different, say, program designs or things along those lines. And so to use the tools to really try to present options to the community and, uh, and to flesh out what are the potential projected sort of outcomes in terms of some of the uh, social outcomes they care about where will the allocations end up? Uh, what will the final number of participants be uh, under different policy designs? So I don't know, Jamie, did you catch more questions? Do you have things to- No, think I, I, I think that was a great answer. And I, I, I would only add that one of the things to, to 
for us to keep in mind in both groundwater management and uh, you know, fisheries management is we're not managing groundwater. We're not managing fish. We're managing people. And the most effective strategies, people don't like to be managed. They'd much rather manage themselves. And so this is a governance issue. This is a, a democracy, small d democracy issue. And um, I don't want to get too overblown or whatever, but I, what excites us and what excited, I think, uh, Lynn Ostrom um, and anyone who's worked on a catch share or you know, a, a, a market design for, um, for, for groundwater is a sense of, of being present at the creation. And I, I feel sometimes like it was, you know, like it might have been with a constitutional convention. Um, the difference being, instead of a bunch of old white male property owners, you've got a much more diverse group uh, at the table. And, and had in you know, 1989 or whatever, uh, you had uh, uh, women at the table, youth at the table, non-property owners, slaves, uh, ideally liberated slaves at the table, um, you would have a much different constitution than the one that we're still working with. That said, the, the creation of this management of the commons you know, leaves the room open for evolution, for improvement, for iteration over time. And so that the, the first catch shares like in Iceland that benefited and made millionaires out of you know, these Icelandic fishermen, um, that's not the kind of catch shares that we're looking at today. And, and they are much more inclusive uh, of environmental, of social, of, uh, of governance and political inclusion um, that, uh, that they wouldn't have crossed their minds uh, in the past. All right, thank you both for your answers. Um, the next question is for Kaylin. Have there been any examples of taxes or fee type economic instruments for managing fisheries? Um, for managing the quantity that you would extract. I, I guess I'm going to go back. I thought that uh, Arthur did a really nice job dividing um, these tax and fee kind of questions into, are you using it as an instrument to manage the total extraction, or are you using it as an instrument to uh, extract some of the profit to fund management? And Brittany, can I just throw that back to you? Can you understand, you read that, and I, I think I didn't catch which question that relates to. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Ellen, uh, me. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry. That, that was a question that came from me. Um, I was just, I mean, I guess, yeah, I, we had all this discussion about markets for managing groundwater and for fisheries, um, but you know, from an economic perspective, fees or taxes are another way to sort of achieve very similar economic yeah. goals. Yep. And so, you know, obviously there are, there's this administrative component and that's certainly what's being proposed in the Sigma context or these fees to uh, cover those administrative costs. And I was just curious if there have been any examples in fisheries management historically where taxes were used as a tool for achieving sustainability of those fisheries, not just covering these administrative costs. And maybe it never has happened because it's just too politically contentious. But I was just curious if you had any um, if you had any examples off the top of your head. Yeah, I think that's a really great question now that yeah why, why not if we always do we kind of contrast the tax versus the cap and trade if we're thinking about environmental regulations or something like carbon right um and yeah historically that has not gone over in the fisheries context for you know more political reasons but one of the things that i think is really interesting i would add you know jamie talked a little bit about the fish and the water context and how averse people are to paying to access these resources but if we think of something like oil there, it's very well accepted that you know this is uh, this is something that is our country's resource, and so you, if you're going to access it, you pay for it. But somehow that is not transferred over, and I think maybe because of the history. So you know historically, especially on the East Coast, access was free, and so if it's free at one point, um, is it really hard to then revert to a scheme where you would really heavily tax for for access, and so. Um, no, Ellen, I think the answer is that uh, sort of the precursor to these programs that really think more about economic efficiency, if you're thinking more of an environmental kind of limit, you would implement something where you would just track the landings and then you would close once that environmental limit uh, was hit. And so 
when we think of contrasting different management regimes and fisheries, that would be more of the contrast that, that I would build. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, and then I think Kaylin kind of covered the, the second part of your question, Ellen, um, about what- Sorry, it, I don't even know. Oh yeah, yeah, she covered that. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't even remember what the second part was. <laughs> I think that's all of the questions that we have, and I guess we're we're just about out. Of, so I'll go ahead and um, share my screen with the last. Um, can you see everyone? So um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight. Oh, thank you for all of the panelists that took part today. This was really interesting. I learned a lot about fisheries and and sigma and how we can sort of link the two. Um, and so next, the next webinar will be March 19th. We're still determining what um, that will be and getting the speakers around, but um, you can look for updates on our website, arediscussions.ucdavis.edu or, or check your email. Um, and you can also subscribe on the website as well. So thank you all for joining. And um, I think that's it. Great, thanks for organizing. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.